time to film again. <laughs> Hi, my name's Joey, I'm 23 years old, I'm a bassoonist. I have a basketball game tomorrow. And welcome to my final project for the Arts and Society. Now, before you syllables checkers start like judging me because I'm not doing some uppity TED talk, first of all, chill the fuck out. Secondly, I'm trying to stay on brand for my talk, so bear with me. By the way, if you like see me holding like a bottle of Diet Pepsi at any moment, like I've been drinking this since I've been filming and I'm showing no signs, so. In our current era, it's hard not to be on at least one form of social media. Whether it's to stay informed about the goings-on in the world, stay connected with friends we've made, or maintaining a steady online business, social media has become an indelible part of our lives. As artists, how can we not take advantage of that? We often gripe about outreach and accessibility in terms of the arts, and yet we have this relatively untapped market in social media. Sure, a lot of big artists and arts organizations have YouTubes, Twitters, Facebooks, etc. But besides photos promoting their latest performances, selfies with like the guest talent that's showing up that week, or the occasional Instagram takeover by a guest, it's kind of basic. And that's when I thought, you know, what are some artists that use social media effectively? What are some cool ways performers like you or I use their online platforms to promote either their art or something else. I began searching for answers, and after much research, lots of hours watching YouTube and Instagram videos, and a metric ton of Red Bull, I'm back with my results. The category are traditional performing artists like classical musicians or dancers who use their social media platforms in a more interesting way than the basic Instagram photo story or basic blog. Um, and even if they take that basic idea or they jump on a train like reaction videos or challenge content, their content broadcasts a distinct view on their lives as an artist. Unfortunately, social media has become a lot of, well, this. Good morning, Jake Paulers! Good morning, Jake Paulers! Like I was saying, Jake Paulers, good morning, what is going on? Oh, what is that? I'm a toothbrush! It makes it difficult to find quality content that serves an enriching purpose. But I think these creators do a good job, and if we choose to present content online, we should follow their example. So, without further ado, here is a look at how some artists use social media. The first traditional artist we'll talk about today is Hilary Hahn. So, we all know those viral videos where someone takes a photo of themselves every day for one year and then puts it in a really quick photo montage to see how they visibly changed within 365 days. But what if we filmed a video of ourselves practicing every day and watched our progress on one piece or maybe just in general? Enter Hilary Hahn. One of the biggest violinists of our modern era, Hilary grew up a child prodigy and has since turned into a tour de force in the music world, with multiple solo albums and solo performances across the world. With all that traveling, it's kind of hard to imagine how she practices effectively. And... Yeah. <laughs> It's sort of hard, like, could you imagine, like, she really travels. If you follow her on Instagram, she's all over the world. Like, she's one day in Munich, and then the next day she's in Tokyo. Like, right now, I think she's in, like, a residency in Tokyo. It's insane. Her schedule's crazy. Anyways, what was her solution? Well, she committed herself to practice every day for 100 days, recording a little video about it and posting it on Instagram. And so, the 100 days of practice hashtag was born. According to an article in Strings Magazine, Han would just put her phone down whenever she had some spare time and would just start recording. She would just go to town. She mostly practiced her solo repertoire and boiled it down to such a point where the music was almost unrecognizable. She was basically improvising little etudes to help her with um, practicing for a performance that she would have on the same day. I mean, I could talk about the playing all day, really, because it's so fascinating to watch her practice as, you know, a very important soloist of the modern times. But the real impact was in the reaction. It turned into a huge movement within the younger generations of musicians on Instagram. Um, on Instagram alone, there are about 140,000 videos of the 100 days of practice hashtag, which shows you that it really has blown up 
Um, I know I tried to do it myself last year and I gave up on day 17 because I'm a wuss. A lot of people started posting their own videos and they started opening up about whether they deem themselves successful or not in a daily practice session. It was cool to see that people could have off days. Some of the best musicians I know would often post about today didn't go as planned and it's like it's so cool seeing a new level of honesty within the classical music world because honestly i'm so used to just putting my best self out there that i'm like what if i make a mistake one time is my career over i hope not but it was so nice to see this hashtag because i could post my oops and be okay with it i could really just be okay with making mistakes all the time because i you know, it's practice, it's not really like a performance, it's just getting better by, you know, really committing yourself to 100 days. I know I didn't do it, but I know there are a lot of people who did. Maybe some of you guys who have done the 100 days of practice challenge in the audience have done it. So yeah, I think this is a really cool, this was a really cool thing for, you know, keeping musicians and younger musicians especially, super accountable and really cool. One of the best online personalities to rise from the music world are the duo of Brett Yang and Eddie Chen, also known as Two Set Violin. The duo had orchestral jobs in Australia, but they both left them and decided to launch Two Set Violin in 2016, producing videos like sketches, reaction videos, and classical music-related challenge content on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. The videos have really caught on, and with over a million follows on their combined social media, Two Set Violin has become one of the forefront classical music online personalities. <laughs> one of my personal favorites are the Professional versus Beginner series, where they plant a professional instrumentalist or singer in one seat, and then in the other, they either place one of themselves or just like a total noob at that instrument. And then they are just sort of forced to learn how to play that instrument in like the span of one video, it's really, really funny. Um, here's a clip from the bassoon episode as an example. Next, we're going to look at two ballet dancers, one who's part of the uber-traditional Russian school, and one who, well, isn't. So let's start with Ava Gordy, an online personality who's worked with big channels like SourceFed. Cut to a clip. Welcome back to Table Talk. This is SourceFed, live on Table Talk. <laughs> oh my yes. god, Ava! And clever. By the way, if I say, like, cut to a clip too much in this segment, it's because at SourceFed they would always hard cut to a clip by just saying, cut to a clip. <laughs> Let's cut to a clip. I'm gonna say can crutch. Can we cut to a clip? He crutch. said crutching. I said crutch. We can cut to that clip. Let's go to a clip. Let's cut to a clip. Oh. Let's roll some f***ing B-rolls. Is it bees? Before YouTube, Ava trained as a dancer for much of her life. She started out in the child company of the Joffrey Ballet of Chicago, eventually moving to the Ruth Page Civic Center, and then to the Royal Ballet Academy of New Zealand. That's right, New Zealand. That one, in near Australia. But it's not Australia, there's a difference. Just saying. After moving back to the States, Ava joined the Pittsburgh Ballet Company for a few seasons before having to leave due to injury. In recovering from surgery, her time on YouTube began. She started with simple vlogs, and when she was able to dance again, she posted some light dance content dispersed within general vlogs about her life and coming to terms with things like her sexuality and gender. Perhaps some of her most well-known content are educational videos about her trying to teach basic ballet positions and steps to people like her SourceFed co-workers. Cut to a clip. Come back to SourceFed! This is... Co-workers learn the Nutcracker! <laughs> and her best friends. You guys know first position. That is heels together, toes apart. You make a big pizza slice. Oh, I love pizza 
So we're gonna face the bar. These comedic little videos culminate in actually a very serious project to Ava called They Dance. In this video, Ava describes the struggle of being a ballet dancer while not being fully gender conforming. Traditional ballet is arguably one of the most gendered art forms. So for people who don't identify as male or female, it's intimidating to continue ballet past a young age. So what did Ava do? Create her own. Duh. Duh. Her goal for the video was simple. Create a non-binary pas de deux. This video wasn't meant to change the face of ballet and turn the dance world upside down, but rather at least start a discussion about the different ways dance can help with gender expression. One of the great things about Ava's work here is that the choreography is a real team effort. No one is lifted, spun, or assisted more than the other. In a traditional pas de deux, the woman is led around, lifted, turned, and essentially manipulated by the man in the dance. In They Dance, without that clear gender divide, the two dancers were able to switch off in their partnering steps, thus creating a blur between the traditional gender line. In an interview about the video, Ava said, it's a story that's based on me and my journey with gender identity growing up as a ballerina. It was ch a challenging experience, but I'm looking forward to sharing this personal journey with an audience. They Dance received a coveted slot at Buffer Festival, the online equivalent of Sundance or Toronto International Film Festival, with screenings at both the short film and LGBTQ plus events at the festival. I think this is a really cool concept. In order for the most traditional arts like ballet to grow, people need to push past the limitations of what the art is defined by, really. Though it's not fully refined, I think Ava should continue this work because I'd love to see more ballets that don't follow the gender binary. If Ava Gordy represents an untraditional section of the ballet world, then it doesn't get more traditional than Joy Womack. Joy is one of the most fascinating people uh, on the face of the earth, just saying, no, no pressure to all of you. She's the first American to be accepted and to graduate from the Bolshoi Ballet Academy in Moscow, and she's also the first um, American to dance with the Bolshoi Company. She's also been a principal dancer with the Kremlin Ballet, also in Moscow, and the Universal Ballet in Seoul, Korea. She mainly uses YouTube and Instagram to share the details of her daily life, and has talked about ballet and dance on big podcasts like the Jenna and Julian podcast, which is hosted by two of the biggest social media creators at the moment, Jenna Marbles and Julian Solomita. Now, her stuff is actually quite simple. She vlogs a lot in her spare time, usually during her daily ballet class, or from the backstage of her performance. But the reason I really want to talk about Joy is because she has a very honest take about her life as a dancer. One of the things about social media content, for better or worse, is that you can edit out your mistakes and just post your best self. Joy posts everything. She's vlogged about her experiences of success and dancing for some of the biggest stages in the world. You can check out one where she literally dances for Vladimir Putin, which, you know, say what you want but to dance for a, one of the most well-known figures of the modern era is pretty sick. Um, but she's also posted about the negatives, like the audition progress and how fragile the state of dance has become. And so I want to be making videos. I want to be talking about the negative side effects because this industry is really built upon this fear culture and almost like this bro kind of like you're a woman you need to please the director kind of a thing and um i'm i'm calling bs and you know maybe in the future i'll get to work with a big company but to be honest i don't really want to because her recent content is something i think everyone here can learn from She's just left her principal position at Universal Ballet and is back in Moscow. Now she's essentially working as a freelancer. Um, as of December 2018, she's on this huge European tour with dancers from all across the world, but they all train in Moscow, and she's so happy doing it. To see someone who is honest with their dissatisfaction about being in a company, she's literally called out the Kremlin Ballet for being lazy and saying that only like a few of them show up to ballet class every day and like no one really cares about like the basics and like that's not cool. Uh, <laughs> it was, it's really nice to see someone actually be open about, you know, being dissatisfied with being in a company. 
She mentioned in a recent video that she felt not being attached to a specific company would let her gain the artistic growth she's been looking for. To sacrifice financial and social security in the name of fostering creativity is a pretty cool thing. I guess what I'm trying to say is that the internet and social media are some of the most diverse and flexible performance spaces in the world. With the power of online platforms, we can reach an audience we would have thought unimaginable like just two, three, four years ago. Millions of people are constantly looking for stuff to enjoy online. And if that stuff can be you, that's absolutely fantastic. I, you know, I'm trying to do my own stuff on social media. Obviously I haven't gone viral because if I went viral, I wouldn't be sitting here. But I like to just post little arrangements that I made on Bassoon and I like I post them on Instagram. For example, here's me playing an excerpt from Don Quixote. <laughs> Like I said before, I'm not viral or I haven't really achieved viral fame at all, but I love doing it because I get to show my followers, like, you know, the few that I have, what I do and how much fun I do. How much fun I do. That makes no sense. I, I just get to show them how much fun I have playing the bassoon and playing music. And at the end of the day, getting to do our art for a living should be fun. So why not let someone else have fun with you? Well. I'm gonna sign it off there because I think that's a really good message to end the video with.